a good solid family structure is one that supports you whether you are a celebrity or you're not is one that fully supports you whether you're on a mountaintop or in a valley it's one that will walk through the trenches of life with you and also one that will celebrate your achievements with sure. you that i don't roll in the mud with the pigs i'm not the sort of person i'm not slanderous i'm not malicious i'm not i'm not it's not me it's not in my nature one thing in life i know for sure is that i would not be where i am if it wasn't for the grace of god mm -hmm. i know that for a fact I realized that the platform hosts a lot of influential people. It hosts a lot of people who have a deeply emotional story or just have a life journey that is deeply inspirational or a life a journey that we all can learn from. And with that and life being so full and, and rosy and full of challenges, I just want to know how's your heart today? It's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm at peace. Yeah. Yes, yes. You're right, life is busy. There's a lot that happens, you yeah. know, with parenting and uh, my job and business and everything. So there's always, you know, you get pulled in all different directions all the time. And so it's it's important that I have it all together. Sure, sure. And sometimes I don't have it all figured out. But sure. God does, so that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, but I'm at peace. Yeah. 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 What does peace mean for you? For me, it means even in the midst of the chaos, you still sure. stand steadfast. Mm, mm, so mm. it's it's intentionally not allowing yourself to be anxious. Yeah. Intentionally not allowing yourself to be pulled in all sorts of directions. Mm -hmm. um, it's about having a calm demeanor and having it all together because you know that you are held. I get that's, you. That's, that's what it means to Would me. Would you say that yeah. people who allow external factors to influence a lot of their decision making so that eventually they're not at peace, hence they're just always angry, always vitriol towards others? Yeah, yes and no. I think, I think you can allow external factors to deter you. Mm -hmm. um, so where you're very much like a leaf in the wind. Mm -hmm. So this is happening in the press, this is happening in the country, this is happening politically. So you're all over the place. Um, and if you put your value on that, mm -hmm. then you'll definitely have your peace disturbed. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you put your value on your ability and on God, mm -hmm. and you put your value on... In the midst of the noise, I can still just be calm yeah, and yeah, make yeah, cool, yeah. calm, calculated decisions because you know your source and you know for whom you live. Then, No matter what happens in your life, you're at peace. I love that. I'll come back to, to peace and purpose um, because I think it's a pivotal part of our conversation. On a lighter note, yes. um, you know, that I've sat with a lot of artists on that chair and I often ask this question of, um, who's that one person in life whom you believe is living out their purpose? So artists would say Beyonce, um, um, sports stars would give uh, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. In your life, is there a particular person you look at and you're like, that person is truly living in their purpose? And you're like, I, I resonate with that and I take a lot from that. It's a very difficult question. Um, because oftentimes I think I'm living out my purpose. Sure. Um, and it's very difficult from an external point of view mm -hmm. to really ascertain if someone's living out their purpose. Oof. And I'll tell you why. So, for example, some people may have a certain gifting. Mm -hmm. And they're very good at, say, football or... And then they make a career of it, and that is their passion, mm -hmm. okay? And they've managed to turn their passion into profit because it's their livelihood, and that's how they influence people, and that's their day-to-day. But is it truly their purpose or mm. are they called for more? Mm. Are they called for something else? Mm. So sometimes you may see someone that is living out their passion mm. and they're using it to add value and to enhance society and to influence communities and that. And oftentimes that may be their passion, but not necessarily their purpose. So I, I think there's a fine line. I get um, you. Whereas someone's purpose may be using that passion to enhance communities mm -hmm, where mm -hmm, the purpose mm -hmm. is that. That's mm -hmm, the purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 
God is using that passion to fulfill the purpose. But does that individual actually know that that's their purpose? Somehow purpose always goes back to community building. No, no matter how much we can try and run away from it, um, regardless of what sphere we plugged into, be it you're an engineer, you're a musician, you're a sports star, somehow purpose, God always wants us to come back and grow the next person, you know, um, send the ladder down so that somebody else can climb. Would you say then, once you've identified that so many people are living out passions rather than purpose, that's what usually happens. That's why you find artists dying poor, sports stars dying poor, because they couldn't use the money. They had the passion, they built the career, but they didn't know how to execute. And I think where you have godly alignment mm -hmm. with your purpose, and I think that once God has given you a gift and you know how to use it to fulfill the purpose he's given you, Yeah. That the sustenance will just follow. Mm -hmm. it, he mm. will provide. Mm. It, that's what it says in the word. But Bongani, it's hard to no, believe. No, it is that, hard. It's hard to believe that I will be sustained. You know, I, I, the, the situations around me are so tough. I can't see the sustenance. But you see, that's where trust comes in. Yeah. And I have found myself in situations where I've had no other choice but to trust God. Mm -hmm. It's like where you know that you cannot put your hope in man, mm -hmm. but you know that God says he will. So mm -hmm. you have to kind of die to self mm -hmm, mm -hmm, let yourself mm -hmm, go mm -hmm. and fully trust yeah yeah and it's yeah. not easy it's i not. won't even lie it's really really not easy and i think that once you fulfill your purpose or once you're living in purpose um god uses that to go beyond yourself the mm -hmm. whole point of purpose is to impact people and for for god to use that to change lives and sure. to impart seeds and sow and reap a harvest it's not just it cannot end with just you um so I, I love that conversation and I love stretching myself, stretching myself in that. And I love how, how God uses various aspects of your life to actually lead you to that purpose driven life. Sure. Yeah. How yeah. did you identify your own purpose? Is there a moment where you identify or as you're journeying along, you then realize that no man, I'm feeling more fuller. My life is feeling more fulfilled rather than is it just a moment where you're like, oh, now it's purpose moment. It's never like a pin drop moment yeah, yeah. because I think if it was a pin drop moment from like a certain age, then you would go to straight to that. Mm -hmm. I think you have to kind of pursue a career, pursue family, pursue life you get off track, then you get kind of pulled back to that. And what is that purpose? Okay, you're still trying to figure it out. And you once you know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Once you, you just have, you, you know what you're called for. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually agree with that. Yeah. Speaking of career, purpose, family, um, you seem to be a person everything that I come across about you, you value family. Very much. You value your siblings. You just value the family unit. Is the family unit something that still should be given the attention that it deserves nowadays? Because it seems to be neglected. Um, fame seems to be more important. Money attributes. Um, having a certain type of body seems to be more important. Um, affiliating in certain social circles seems to be more important. What does family mean to Bongani? Family is everything. Sure. You can pursue money. Once you lose money, what do you have? Hmm. You can pursue a hot body. Once you put on weight, what do you have? Hmm. So it's what do you put your value in? And for me, a good solid family structure is one that supports you whether you are a celebrity or you're not. It's one that fully supports you whether you're on a mountaintop or in a valley. It's one that will walk through the trenches of life with you and also one that will celebrate your achievements with sure, you. Sure, sure, sure. Um, we found ourselves living in society where life is tough and life is uncertain. And I always think that time is limited. And so if you've got limited time, you better make the best use of it, mm, mm, right? Mm, mm, mm. You don't want to look back one day and say, oh, I should have actually spent time doing that. Or I should have spent more time with my kids. Or I should have spent more time with my parents or with my siblings. When you have the time, Spend the time. Sure, sure, sure. Those quality moments you cannot replace. So when it's one of their birthdays, celebrate as a collective. Correct. When one of them is graduating, show up and pull through for mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. When one of them is going through a hard time, all pull through and support them. And that's one thing that I'm very proud of with, with the way I was raised and with my extended family and also with the family unit I have now mm -hmm. where without any reservation, 
if my kid has a football game, I'll go. Yeah. Without yeah. any reservation. If my dad is in hospital, I will go. It's it's being intentional about how you spend time and sowing those seeds for the people that truly matter the most. Yeah. Because yeah. that's your foundation. Yeah. That is yeah. your foundation. If you don't have that, then what do you have? You what know? is left? And what is left? Yeah. Because you can put all your time and, effect and attention pursuing a career and be very successful at it and neglect your family. But you'll get to a place where you're at the top of that ladder and your relationships with your family are broken. Mm -hmm. You look back and you realize your son is now 20 and is now pursuing his own life, but you did not invest the time when mm -hmm. they were six, seven, eight, mm -hmm. when they actually needed you, you know? So you've got to, you've really, family's everything. Your son was raised by the helper, pretty much. You see, then what? Yeah. Then you, you've lost that connection. Yeah. And your son also will then be more comfortable divulging certain sensitive things to the helper than yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No Meanwhile, families. you're a superstar at work. You've got a huge title. You claim to be changing lives at work, but at home, you, you zero impact. And I can tell you, in a corporate environment and at work, you are as replaceable as I click hmm. my fingers today. Yeah. But at home not replaceable yeah, yeah you know so where are you devoting your time and attention hey family a quick one over 87 percent of you are consuming this content every single week but are not subscribed that means you are enjoying the growth conversations but you are not liking you're not subscribing and you're not sharing it with others so please i plead with you please subscribe so that you can share the love you can share the growth and you can share this wonderful platform and wonderful safe space with others as well enjoy the episode what is the importance of finding that balance since we're there and you've just spoken about your your corporate role of finding that balance between being a highly independent successful woman in the corporate space i mean you're an executive in corporate which is very few and far between for black women in south africa um how do you find to remain a black woman who has core family values yeah. and still be a corporate giant yeah so i've always been unapologetic about family and in every single role that I've had throughout my career I've had to be extremely vocal about my unwillingness to compromise on family okay and so I'm very fortunate that I work for an organization that is very much pro-family okay um and so having that flexibility and having worked myself to a position where I can have flexibility is very important because then I can curate my activities and structure my time such that I will be there for my son's assembly. I will be there for his football game. I will be there for my partner Matthew's football game. I will be, because I have the flexibility and sometimes it means I'll go to bed at one o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. every night for two weeks to run the business. Mm -hmm. um, but that's okay. I'll give you another, another example. So I'm a firm believer that time is created. Um, and so some people will say, oh, I don't have time to exercise because my day is full and oh, I actually sure, don't have time sure, for sure. this. And I know how the pressures of life can lead one not to have the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you can create the time. Correct. And so for me, exercise is a fundamental part of my life mm -hmm. and it enables me to be the best partner and the best mom and the best corporate exec and the best businesswoman because then I'm in the right frame, frame of, of mind, mind. Yeah. um and so I'll create the time by waking up at 4 30 so sure. that I can get to the gym at so five. that I can yeah 100 <laughs> yeah, percent. yeah so people oftentimes make excuses I don't have the time and you create the time yeah, yeah. and so throughout my career I've had to be intentional about prioritizing my family within the ambits of whether I'm running business or whether I'm in a corporate role or whether I'm in everything. It's that foundation. I love, I love that you say that. Um, my calendar is, is, is linked to the gentleman who pretty much um, has access to running my life. Right. And he, he lo once laughed at me when he saw rest. He saw gym. Oh, I totally. schedule rest. So do I. I schedule holiday so that it's blocked out and you're not touching it. Because touch you it. as the person who's organizing my life, you have access to put things into my calendar, right? And then yeah. all of a sudden, if I think, oh, I'm going to be resting that day and he, he sees it empty. It's not his fault. He saw an empty space. Yeah, he'll slot someone in. He'll slot someone in, right? Yes. So I love that you're saying that 
even being as uh, as as petty as petty as putting in 5 fm gym time on your calendar i'm not giving you leeway to organize me a meeting at six hundred percent like no don't 100%. book me a 6 a.m flight because you see that i can't make it because i'll be finishing gym at six you know exactly so i i i agree with you on a lighter note um you've never spoken much about your childhood uh and part of me judging from how eloquent you are i i feel like there's there's a story there I feel like there's a, there's a deep story there and that story is very nuanced and it's very full and there's a lot to learn from it. But then you also confused me because when you walked in, you spoke in Zulu. I'm like, but I've never heard her speak in Zulu. So what is this? <laughs> yes. Where's home and where did it all start? People always, they can never figure me out <laughs> because I speak English so well and yeah. I speak a number of languages actually. So I'm very fortunate that I'm a polyglot. Yeah. Um, and so, and it's, and it's really helped me a lot in business sure, because sure. If you're going to be meeting with Zulu businessmen, it it goes a long way for Correct. you to address them in their vernacular. Absolutely. Or you're going to meet with someone in Sutu, you must yeah. switch to Sutu. You know? Yeah. So I'm Shangan. Okay. Um, I grew up in Velkom, which is a Sutu-speaking area, mm -hmm. Sutu and mm -hmm. Afrikaans. So mm -hmm. I can speak both Sutu and Afrikaans. Sure. My mother Tosa, my father's Shangan. I got exposure to a lot of different languages from a very young age. My a dad real also polyglot. speaks. <laughs> a real polyglot. <laughs> Um, so I speak a number of the South African languages and I speak a bit of German and French. So, <laughs> so yes, I speak a lot of languages, which kind of confuses people sometimes. Mm. And it also catches people off guard as like, if they don't figure you out and then yeah, they try yeah. and gossip about you like in Sutu, yeah. but you actually understand them. And then you address them in Sutu and they're like, oh no, I shouldn't have said that. <clears throat> you know, I'm one of three girls. Um, mm -hmm. I was raised in, um, a very educational driven family. It makes sense. So from a very young age, I was taught that education is the one thing that will emancipate you from poverty. Sure. Okay. So from as long as I can remember growing up, my parents were always studying towards something mm, mm, all mm, mm, the mm. time. Um, I grew up in Tabong, which is a township in, in Velkom. And um, I recall my dad wanted me to go to a private school. Mm -hmm. And there are two in Velkom, it's St. Dominic's and St. Andrews. Yeah. So I started off my academic career going to a private school in the township called Siabo. And um, my dad wanted to take me to a private school, uh, one of the two. And then he took me there and they said, Moss, your child does not know how to speak English, so we can't take her. So my dad said, okay, give us a month and she'll learn how mm, to speak mm, English. Mm, then we mm. went home and it was an aggressive, you're going to learn English now. Wow. And I remember my dad would would speak to me in English and I would respond to, to him in Susutu and be like, no, 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 what is that in English? So I, it was really intense. Right, right. Um, it was in the apartheid era. Welcome was very Afrikaans, very racist sure. at the time. And so having a black girl go to a white school was like... And uh, this anomaly. Yeah. Yeah. But with my upbringing, I was always raised that with God, you can do anything hmm. and you can always go anywhere. Come on. And that there is never a door that's shut if God can just blast it open. Mm. So I managed to learn how to speak English. I was accepted at St. Andrews. My dad did not have the money. And then he started a taxi business to be able to send me to that school. A taxi business which in itself has grown to be something massive. He's got a fleet of buses and taxis and, and that sort of thing over time. Oh, so my dad taught me business from yeah, a very, very yeah. young age. Um, I went to St. Andrews. I was involved in music from a young age. I started learning how to play the piano at the age of seven and then the flute at the age of eight. Um, I played in the Velcom Blast Orchestra, which is the, the orchestra yeah, as the yeah. only black girl in the orchestra, yeah. which was also tough in its own right. You know, sure. you'd go there as a little girl, the white kids wouldn't want to share their music with you. They would tell you that black people are dirty because mm. your skin is darker. Mm. So I remember going home and crying and my dad would be like, why are you crying? I said, no, because they were mean to me and they didn't want to share their music with me. And he would just say, my girl, you're there to learn a skill and you're going to persevere and you're going to learn that skill. So focus on that. Don't focus on what they say because you know you're there for something. So a very stern upbringing um, my two younger sisters, um, we all grew up there in Valcom. Um, I then went into chemical engineering. 
um, my younger sister, after me, she went into civil engineering and my youngest sister went into medicine. Okay. So it was always education. Your dad has been very intentional. That's what I'm getting from this. Oh, I totally. Mean, right down to building his own businesses, right down to something as simple as saying, I'm teaching you English, so you're going to speak back to me in English. Oh, for sure. Whether you're going to break the words, give me incorrect it grammar. It doesn't matter. But I'm, I, I need you to keep walking. Keep walking. That's it. Keep grappling. That's it. And that, do you think that's where you find the spirit of keep walking, keep walking, keep pushing boundaries as well? And also just raised with the will to win. Okay. If there's a phrase that was always used in my upbringing, it's you, you must always have the will to win. Nothing is impossible. If you want to go for that thing, you go for it. If you want to win in that thing, you go for it. No one can ever tell you that you cannot do it. But Bongani, rejection is tiring. Yeah, As you try and tiring. win, there's so much rejection along the way. How do you deal with that rejection? But remember that rejection, rejection is also character building. Okay. So you always have a choice. You have the choice to be rejected and to take the rejection and accept it. Or you have the choice to keep going mm -hmm. and keep trying. And say, you may reject me now, but there's someone that will accept me eventually. Oof. So don't give up. Just keep yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. So I was raised um, in Velcom. I decided to go for chemical engineering. Yeah. Because my parents had started this business and I could see how hard they were working to send me to the school. Yeah. From a very young age, I had it in me to be the best. Okay. Because if my parents are sacrificing so much to send us here, I will be number one. Mm -hmm. So I had a very solid work ethic from a very young age. And I was always in the top two from grade one mm -hmm. all the way mm -hmm. through to matric. Um, and as a result of hard work and tenacity, then I was headhunted by Sassol, who okay. offered me a bursary to okay. study engineering at any institution of my choice. And I looked into engineering quite early on. Um, I had a maths and science teacher who was a chemical engineer from the DRC. So he introduced me to engineering and sure. I found it quite fascinating. And because I loved Formula One and I loved motor racing and I loved cars and I thought, oh my gosh, then I can get into F1. And that was the ambition at the time. And chemical engineering was the most logical option. Um, petrochem was, oil and gas was the most logical sure. option. Yeah. And I also loved that as a chemical engineer, you can work in a number of various industries, Correct. whether can, it's investment banking yep. or management consulting. Management yeah. consulting. So the opportunity for growth and career progression was appealing to me mm -hmm. even then as a 16 year old. Sure, sure, sure. So I loved that and I went into that and, and I chose UCT because it had one of the best chemical engineering departments in the country, still does have. Mm -hmm. Um, and I chose Cape Town because it was very far from Velcro. <laughs> new life, new me. New life, new me. <laughs> but it was tough, I won't lie. Yeah. My degree I loved, I, I flourished right through it, but being in Cape Town by myself, um, and then I just got myself involved in church quite hectically, actually. And I think, and that was the year I gave my life to the Lord, 2003. I was in my first year. Um, and I had always known that there was a reason that I learned the piano and the flute and got really musical. And even though intellectually and academically, I was very strong in engineering yeah, and yeah. all that. And I believe if you do have that solid work structure, you can be good at anything and everything <laughs> that you do. Um, but I always knew that there was a reason that God planted that music seed. Sure, sure. And it had to be for his purpose and it had to be for him. And so I got involved in worship in a massive way. Um, and that really got me through both my degrees, actually. Um, yeah, at his people. Back I, I, I'm smiling because before the cameras went on, you asked me, what are you doing podcasting as an engineer? I know. Look at you. I know. <laughs> Same Z's. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah, right. yeah. Um, one person can be gifted in so many ways. Um, it can be. God is limitless when it comes to what he can help us pursue, help yes. us be great at. And as you're saying, with the correct work, eth work ethic, rather, you can be the best. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. You can just be absolutely the best in anything you put your mind into. I'm going to go a bit sensitive. You, you will wheel me in. I know you have the, 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 oh, the, the prowess to wheel me in. Trust and believe. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, it comes with B 
being a person of power, a person of influence, a person who we spoke about God and how challenges come and situations that we have to face situations. People then try and minimize everything you've done, everything you've built, how many lives you've changed. And there are external forces that try and minimize your work and your contribution to society through your personal life, you know. Um, one, how was that time for you? Because when I looked back at that time, it, it felt dark and painful, especially the one that was public. And looking back at that time, do you feel like it had to happen and life goes on? So it was, it was, it was difficult to find myself in the center of a public scandal. Sure. Um, and it, what made it very difficult as well was that there were so many mistruths. Okay. So many. Um, and the tough thing about it was that I could not respond. So I felt muzzled a little bit um, because there's all these things. And I found myself in the midst of public ostracism. I was insulted by people that don't even know me. Mm -hmm. I was ridiculed by people that didn't know me. I was um, dragged by individuals that believed a single narrative. Okay. My side of the story was sure. never shared. Sure. Matthew's side of the story was never shared. Mm -hmm. To this day, it has just been a one-sided narrative. Um, and it was difficult and it was dark. I had to protect my kids. Um, I had my number plate trending on social media. Oh my um, I felt my life was in danger. Um, so it was a very, very difficult mm. time. Um, but I think that it is through those times of adversity that you truly, firstly, you get to know who your real people are. Okay. So who are people that, mm -hmm. that know you? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Who are people that you can rely on? Um, and in the midst of it, where's God? He hmm. was right in the center of it. Hmm. Right in the center of it. And so it is in those trying times where you have to be truthful and you have to do the right thing. Um, and so it wasn't easy by any means, but it is through that kind of adversity. And I've had adversity throughout my life. Sure. But it is through adversity where you realize that God has a big purpose for you. Hmm. God has mass, something massive for you. Um, so what I found quite funny, though, or um, interesting, was that in certain instances, the same people that were insulting me, once they found out how much of a heavy hitter I was in industry, yeah, yeah, the yeah. same people started asking me for employment. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> So the, the public is very fickle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that social media as a platform to drag people is just wrong mm -hmm. and it should not happen. And if there are personal things, they should be dealt with personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in this instance, um, it went south really, really quickly and, and it exposed the character of certain people in both my and Matthew's lives. Sure. Um, and, um, looking back, we are so much stronger. Okay. And I think what was intended to break us actually drew us closer together, um, and strengthened us. And for me in, in the midst of the storm, I still think of it as like this massive tornado. Jesus is right in the center yeah. of it. So I just hung on to him and we just hung on to him. God is always there in the and fire. He is <laughs> right there. Yeah. He is right there. No matter what you're going through. And, you know, um, what we don't realize is the things that break your heart, because this did, they break his heart too. Hmm. And so, yeah, I'm grateful for his grace. Um, I would not have been able to overcome it without his protection, his grace, his love, and his presence through it all, and his wisdom. And the one thing that resonated a lot was, trust me, you know, the battle is his. The vindication is his. He'll do it in his time. Isaiah 60, 22. Yeah. In his time, he will make it happen swiftly. And so to remain true. And also another thing I must mention is that I don't roll in the mud with the pigs. So it wouldn't have been, I'm not the sort of person. I'm not slanderous. I'm not malicious. I'm not 
I'm not, it's not me, it's not in my nature. I remain dignified, truthful, and I operate with integrity. And so I was not going to get into a wrestling match with strangers that don't even know me from a bar of soap, you know. So that was, it was difficult to just be still. You know it well, be still and know. Hmm. Just be still, do the right thing. Um, and I'm grateful for God's protection and grace. I'm grateful that something that was intended to destroy me actually built me up. And I'm grateful that um, what was intended to destroy my livelihood and um, all those things actually just propelled me forward yeah, so yeah, much more. Yeah. And the, I, the only way I can explain it is God. You, you can't articulate it any other way. Uh, obviously we don't know the intricacies of your private life and no one deserves to know them. Um, it's your life and sure. everybody deserves to be who they are in their privacy. Sure. But I definitely, from observation and how you're speaking right now and how you're sounding so calm and the peace that you spoke about when we oh, opened yeah. this conversation, is that sometimes uh, what comes as a battle in our lives helps us really to shed a lot of dead weight that we didn't realize that we need to shed. As you're saying, you discover who are your friends. Because when there's public humiliation, you realize that there are people who are getting closer to me or there are people who are loving me more and being my shoulder to cry on. You know, there's just so much that happens so quickly. And, and I think that's what I'm realizing from you. you, you you're so rooted in who you are right now because there's, it has brought so much clarity. No, for sure. And and it's really just keeping your circle small. Okay. You can get roped into what people say, but those people, they'll be gone as quickly as they come. Mm. Um, they don't contribute to your livelihood. They don't pay your children's school fees. You know, it's just opinions and it's just talk. Um, and so one has to be grounded and rooted and one has to surround themselves with people that you know for a fact that they love you. You know for a fact that when they ask you how you are, they genuinely want to know how you are. There's some people that will just say, hey, how are you doing? But just because they want to find out the juice okay, or what's going okay, on in I your life, you. Yeah. you know. So I had to shut a lot of doors. Okay. Um, and I had to just keep that circle of trust. Um, and it, it was a difficult two years, I'll be honest. Um, with a lot of wins, with a lot of growth. And you get to know who's sincere and who's not. Um, and you protect your peace at all costs. Yeah, I always yeah. say it often. Protect your peace at all costs. Um, and just do the right thing, you know. Just do the right thing. Boot Africa. Yes. A beautiful foundation. It's a foundation, right? That's right. Um, something that alarmed me, which I've never heard from a foundation before, is that this foundation is about bringing people whose livelihoods were lost back, which is crazy because somebody, either they lost their livelihood through circumstances or through their own mistakes. But you're saying, here's a second, third, fourth chance. Just explain to me what it means to help people bring back their livelihoods. So I love it. It's, it's livelihood restoration. It's something I'm very, very passionate sure. about. Um, so in the life of a footballer and in the life of many athletes and stuff, they have their moments of fame, uh, they have their time to shine, their flavor of the month, you know, everyone wants to see them, but that has an expiration date. And oftentimes these professional footballers, they don't do future planning. So they don't, um, make provision for pension. And unfortunately in this country, it's not something that is mandated. In other countries like the Netherlands, footballers, a portion of their salary will go towards a pension fund by law, like mandated, sure, right? Sure, sure. And that helps to look after them in their old age. Whereas in South Africa, that's not the case. So they make a lot of money in a short period of time and then their careers end. They slip into a depression because that euphoria of being, you know, the stadium, that, that kind of dies down. Oftentimes, society forgets about you, in inverted commas, because you're no longer the star someone else now is. And your resources are dwindled because also without sound financial planning and financial decisions, their income is blown on like mm -hmm. the soft life. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so we are very driven and um, determined to help them 
you know, with livelihood restoration. That's why we involve them in our initiatives with football clinics. Uh, we involve them with international football games um, just to help them along. Um, and we want to make a more meaningful impact by helping them with their future planning and that sort of thing. Is this so, like yeah. a, a, a means of, for example, as you said, I blew my money, I blew it. And you helping me find space back in the football, whether it be a coach, uh, yes. whether it be a mentor, yes. so that I can have a livelihood again, because yes. the knowledge and the talent is still there. I might have not been, I might not be flavor of the month anymore, but I still have the talent. Yes, no, for sure, exactly. So they still have that skill. So let us cultivate that skill and let them add value to younger kids. You know, it's, it's invaluable, <laughs> but not just the skills transfer component. It's also the um, restoring hope. So if you take a football legend from a certain community, say Mafikeng, for example, or Mahikeng rather, and now they get involved in a football clinic in Mahikeng. They interact with these kids. It's their own community. That's where they grew up. And therefore they can then give these kids hope that you can also become a pro footballer one day. You can also become like me one day. You can also have emancipation from poverty and drugs and crime and all that stuff, and you can make it. So then you take a little boy or girl who's passionate about the sport, yeah. and you, you get them thinking about, oh, hang on a minute, I too can become something great. And it's the responsibility of every single one of us in our respective professions to sow those seeds of greatness in your younger counterparts and help them so that they don't encounter the same challenges that you did. Sure, sure, you know? sure. So we, we love it. We love it, yeah. Uh, does this also include helping children from lesser popular societies, young boys and young girls, enter into the commercial football space. 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So you, you're able to go up into these rural areas, into these townships that yes. are ignored, Correct. and you're able to bring them into the system. Correct. 100%. So we were actually chatting about it on the Robert Marawa show the other day, um, and that, you know, there's this Cape Town, Joburg, Durban, your metros. Yeah, yeah. There's this misconception that your stars must come from there. Okay. And then you'll get everyone else in the other parts of the country being completely neglected. Yeah. So we are intentional about going into the rural communities, those townships, identifying the talent. Um, so that's also why we involve legends in our initiatives okay. because they can identify the talent and they're scouting opportunities mm -hmm. for these young boys and girls that can then be pulled into the mainstream. Um, get connected to like a Mamelodi Sundowns, whatever league they need to be tapped sure. into. Um, Matthew and I went to uh, Impangeni uh, a couple of years ago, in fact. Um, the talent that comes out of the KZN region is amazing, mm. yeah. you know. And it's not just that region, but there's so many pockets throughout the country sure, sure, sure. that is just untapped. Yeah. So we, we're very intentional about going into those places. I want to go back to work a bit. What does a smart mobility director do? I mean, I'm an engineer myself <laughs> and there's many titles in our space, but what, what sure. exactly does a smart mobility <clears throat> director do? And you're in, a, you're in a big consulting firm that's global. Yes. So how does it shape infrastructure culture per se? Um, yeah. Yes. Mm. So let's start off with what smart mobility is. Okay. So smart mobility is really looking at the movement of people, goods, and services mm -hmm. from point A to B and looking at how you can make that easier through technology and other interventions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in smart mobility, I'm responsible for the team that does infra infrastructure development in the mobility space. So okay. we look at ports, mm -hmm. we look at maritime, mm -hmm. we look at rail, and we look at all roads infrastructure. Okay across the continent. Sure. So I've got quite a, a, a nice sized team. And um, yeah, we're, we're advancing mobility in Africa. So if you think about Johannesburg, let's just bring it home. You will have people that travel from the townships into the urban areas Correct. to come for work. On a daily basis. On a daily basis. Yeah. So our public transport system is still predominantly the CIA taxis that mm -hmm. take people from A to B. Mm -hmm. We've had some challenges with things like Ria via BRT, which is now 
pretty much a white elephant. Um, we do not have adequate non-motorized transport. So? Because you want to encourage people to be able to ride their bikes. I'd mm -hmm. love to ride my bike from my house to the office. Mm -hmm. I would love to. Mm -hmm. But there's no designated cycle lanes. I will most likely get hit by a, a taxi. It's mugged. not safe. I'll be mugged. <laughs> so we look at trying to integrate all these modes of transportation and rely heavily on government to also see the vision and to have the infrastructure master plan that enables integration. Mm -hmm. So having worked in an organization that was majority Dutch owned, which now isn't, going to the Netherlands, you see how you've got various options as to how to travel. Things work. Things work. <laughs> yeah. So you leave your house, you've got options. You can walk, you can ride your bicycle, you can get into your electric vehicle, you can get into your car, you can take the bus, you can take the metro. And all those modes of transportation work. They'll get you from A to B. In South Africa, we don't have the luxury, but we can. And it all speaks to leadership and being intentional. Hmm. So I love, I love what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense because at the core of it, what she's saying is that you made the example of the Netherlands. When, when mobility exists and it exists at a high level, it's directly linked to the economy. Oh, and, sure. and, and socioeconomic issues get solved by the fact that people can get to places. 100%. <laughs> yeah. And it advances. Goods can get to places, 100%. not even people only. 100%. Yeah. So speaking of goods, I mean, if our rail system worked, hmm. then you would have, you know, long haulage happening with quite heavy goods sure. from A to B. Hmm. But now you have to rely on trucks to transport, for example, coal. The trucks are themselves deteriorating mm -hmm. the roads. There isn't sound maintenance, mm -hmm. so then there's potholes. And it's just the snowball effect. You know, we really neglect maintenance in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. So if we can fix our rail system, it would help. And it, rail system would help as well with passenger rail sure. to get people from A to yeah. B. So it's definitely a big economic driver, without question. Yeah. We're nearing the end of our conversation. Um, I, I can't ignore this. Uh, I asked uh, a few weeks ago, uh, you actually being featured in our Celebrating the Power of Women series for August. And a few weeks ago, uh, we opened the series with Pastor Sarah Jakes. And I asked her, what is her definition of purpose? And if purpose can exist outside of God? I want to ask hmm. you that question as well. <laughs> can purpose exist outside of God? I don't think so, no. Ne? He gives you the purpose. Hmm. He plants it in you. You might not see the seed when you're 10 or when you're 20. Some people don't even see it when they're 50. Mm. But it must come from somewhere. And it cannot be, it has to be a purpose-driven life for a reason. And it's a God-given purpose. So using those, I'm using those words intentionally. It's a God-given purpose. You can't have a God-given purpose outside of God. Hmm. And I think that some people realize it a bit too late. But I think if they realized it early on, then you can go to him, the source, and ask him, how do I fulfill this purpose which you gave me for your glory? So purpose and God need to coexist. Would you definitely say then those people who think they are living their purpose, going back to the conversation of passions, they're just living pockets of their passion here and there. Maybe a career they're fulfilling. Maybe they have a partner whom they believe is amazing. But in totality, in the whole full circle, they're not necessarily living out their purpose. Yeah, so you can say, I'll, I'll take a classic example. Say now, let's talk about footballers. Um, and so you're a footballer, you have a football career, you're a celebrity, you're very good at it because that's what you've been playing since you're five years old and stuff, that's great. But now that's been your passion, you've turned it into your profit. Can you use that passion towards a purpose 100%? You know, you can say, God, how do I fulfill this? How do I now use this to impact others' lives? That's purpose-driven. How do I use this to change people's lives? That's purpose-driven. How do I then use this as it's a ministry, actually? Um, and so I really hope that if people's purposes and passions align, that's wonderful because it is God-given. Hmm. 
But it's also about seeking God to get that alignment. I get you. You've got to get that alignment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Last but not least, in 30 seconds, one minute max, what's that one thing in life you know for sure and you're absolutely certain of? One thing in life I know for sure is that I would not be where I am if it wasn't for the grace of God. Mm -hmm. I know that for a fact. Um, everything I've gone through from a little girl to now to a mom, everything from childbearing to career decisions to my executive role to my business decisions to overcoming various adversities in my life. If not for the grace of God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have made it. And so I've put my hope and trust in him from a young age. And um, I know that. I know that like I know the sun will rise tomorrow. That if you do not have faith and if you do not have God, yes, I don't know. You don't have much. Eh? What, I'm getting, <laughs> what I'm getting from Bonganim Tombeni, our incredible guest, is that the sun will rise tomorrow, which means you must keep going in the midst of challenges, in the midst of storms, in the midst of anything that the world or other people, even people you love might bring to you that may not be desirable. You just have to keep on going. And how do you keep on going? According to her, it's through being connected to God. Monganim Tomeni is a businesswoman. She's a leader in a consulting engineering firm and does many more. She's a mother, she's a lover, and she's just an ordinary person who's willingly shared her time with us to show that she's been through a lot, but she keeps soldiering on. Bonga we thank you thank so you much for much. your time and happy Women's Month. Thank you. Um, I hope Women's Month comes with everything it's set to come with. <laughs> Every month is Women's Month. Okay, I get that. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Sure, sure. Introducing the epitome of luxury living. Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.